Hello, my name is Sue Shardlow. I am the Developer Community Manager here at Redis. Thanks so much for joining us today for this week in Discord. If, on Discord. If this is your first time joining us for this show, as the name suggests, it's a weekly show. So we are here every Friday to bring you the latest and greatest from our Discord server. So um, if you don't know anything about our Discord server, you can find it at discord.gg slash Redis. And it is free to join. We have a code of conduct, which if you are a decent person, then it won't be a problem for you. Come along and join us. Um, and you can chat about all things Redis with other people who really love Redis too. And we have been running this show since about the beginning of September. And it's been really cool to just bring you the highlights of what's been happening on Discord each week and questions that people bring to us about all different things. So in case you didn't know, we have a, uh, a platform called the Redis University where we have eight or nine courses that were written by us here in the developer regulations team at Redis. So we have channels dedicated to each of those courses there in the Discord server. We've got language specific channels. We've got a channel for Hacktoberfest, which we're all taking part in at the moment. Um, we've got channels for different modules, all of that good stuff. So come along and have a look. So what we're doing on a weekly basis is we're picking out between three and five really juicy questions, things that really provoked a great discussion on the Redis server and highlighting them to you. So we redact the uh, the names from there. We just put the questions up. So don't worry if you come in your question. We're not going to show your name to everybody. But um, we just show the essence of the question. And then we talk through what the answer is. And as you'll see, there is no such thing as a stupid question. But also, we don't necessarily know the answer off the top of our head either. So a lot of the time, we have to go and look things up. Or people are saying to us, you know, what about this command? How do you do this? You know, can you use this and that? We're like, oh, you know, that's a command I've never used before. So sometimes we learn something too. It's all good. So today I'm joined by Justin and Simon because I'm not an expert in all of these things about Redis. So they know a lot more about it than I do. So I'm going to uh, ask Justin and Simon to bring themselves into the mix here. Hello, people. Hello. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Yeah, it's dark there, Justin. Uh, it looks like it's 6 p.m. to you. It is actually 6 p.m. to us here in the UK. <laughs> yeah, it's finally rainy season up in Washington, so it's going to be dark until maybe June. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I thought it was always rainy season there. Yeah, no, it's been really, really dry like the last, I'd say, two months. Um, I've been really missing the rain because I'm back here and I, I love the rain. So today's a treat. <laughs> I might just go out there and sing in the rain. <laughs> I can imagine after all those dry days, like proper, <laughs> actually, like literally tinder dry days in California, must be a relief. Yeah, no, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, Simon, it's raining here in England, isn't it? It is. It is properly dark and wet, and it's it's dark outside at six p.m. We have like one week of daylight savings left, or something like that. So mm, it's probably time to, uh, I don't know, get some projects for the winter or just hibernate. Yeah, get the blanket out and uh, and get the candles out and, and all of that good stuff. But yeah, like Simon says, the clocks are going to be changing soon. Well, I don't know, actually. It depends on the place, wherever you are in the world. Because I think in America, didn't you all say you weren't going to do the time changes anymore? We say it every year with a lot of intention. And it just sort of falls by the wayside because we have to have so many piles of bureaucracy to sign it off. But um, no, it looks like uh, November 6th, a Sunday... Uh, at 2 a.m., uh, we we turn our clocks back or forward. We just, we, back, yeah. So we, we gain sleep, I believe. Yeah. Is, yeah, that's the cool part. Weird. That's all I care about. Cool. Yeah. Spring forward, fall back. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, and the week, if you do change them, it's always a different week to us. So uh, in the next three to four weeks we're going to have fun and games with all our team meetings and stuff because they won't necessarily be at the time you think they are because we would have changed our clocks and you haven't and then at some point you would have done so um yeah we're gonna to have to be ultra vigilant but there is no easy way of telling people what time something is going to be because 
currently we are X amount of hours away from UTC, that's going to change. So you always kind of have to just say, this is what it is in my local time. Go on the internet and say, what is the current time in the UK? And then just work it out from there. Or, or we all adopt UTC, but yeah. 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 It's yeah. doubly hard in our team because um, those of you who've seen Brian, uh, Java advocate, he's based out of Arizona where they don't have PST. Yeah, they don't change the clock at all, do they? It's an amazing state. Years ahead of its time. Mm. Yeah, and we keep talking about every year, like you say, every year we keep saying, let's abolish uh, Greenwich Mean Time, let's just stick with British Summer Time, and every year it doesn't happen. So I live in hope, you know, maybe one day when I'm an old lady, they'll do that, but not anytime soon, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, it's pitch black outside, but I don't think it's meant to be this dark. I think it's just because we haven't seen the sun all day, basically. It has literally been pelting it down with rain all day. Which is good because I'm collecting rainwater from my Venus flytraps. So, oh, there you go. <laughs> so that's good. But uh, yeah, it's just super dark and I don't really like the dark. Cool. Okay. Let's talk about what's been going on this week on Discord. Again, this week we have had such a variety of different things that people post. And it's so cool because we cannot predict what you're all going to ask us. And we've had some very cool in some cases, long conversations, not because they were difficult, but just because they were fascinating and interesting. So let us go to the first topic. I am going to share the slides. And like I said, we redact people's names because, uh, you know, you post the Discord server. It is, it's private in that it's not Googleable, um, but obviously it's public to whoever's in there and anyone can join. But we don't want to put people's names out on the internet when they haven't asked to be. So uh, there's nothing contentious, but we've just decided to do it that way. So the first question, um, somebody has said they might have found a small documentation issue. And we love it when people find issues. And we love it even more when they come and put in a pull request to fix them. Um, Setex is marked as at slow. And they're saying they're guessing it's at fast with its runtime of, how do you say that? Oh, one. Oh, one. Yeah. One's constant um, runtime. Yeah. So this is a, uh, a speed question. So uh, mm. Simon and Justin, over to you. Okay. So I've got something to show about this. But first off, um, I think we need to define what a few things are here. So what's at fast? So in prior to Redis, this is looks like it's a bit of a digression, but it's not. Prior to Redis 6, everybody logged in as the same user. There, were, there weren't any concepts of users, and everyone could do everything. Um, Redis 6 added something called access control lists, so you can set up different users, and different users can run different commands on different parts of the key space, and you can be quite fine-grained about what they can do. And in order to help with that, Access control lists have uh, command categories. So there's things like uh, commands that write to the database. So you could restrict somebody from doing those, or you can make them a write-only user. And then there's commands that are determined to be fast or slow. So fast commands are super efficient ones. Slow commands are, are less so. This is all relative because Redis is in memory, so it's pretty fast, whatever. And the question was, uh, why is set EX, which is set and set the expiry of something at the same time, marked as a slow access control list command. You would think that like this is like really basic functionality. It should be fast. Um, and then the the other thing here is like, what do we mean by big O of one versus something like big O of N? So big O of one is constant time. That doesn't necessarily mean fast wall clock time. It means that if, for example, a data structure the command adds something to a data structure like a list or something big o of one would mean that the performance of that command doesn't degrade with the size of the list so it doesn't mean that it's fast in the sense of it takes like microseconds it might take 10 minutes but what it means is it takes that same time no matter how big your data structure's got um so i went and looked at well how come how can it be that something like this is actually marked as slow, so relatively slow? Um, and this got quite interesting. So as you can see in there, there's like 20 replies. So I'm going to try and summarize some of those by um, 
share on the desktop. So first off, we've got, this is the Redis IO command page that the conversation stems from. Um, and here we can see time complexity big O of one. So you could argue that big O of one should always be fast. Big O of one is really as good as it gets. It's constant time. Um, it doesn't mean wall clock fast. The time that something takes to run depends on your hardware, the size of the data, all sorts of things. Uh, but then it's it's noted in multiple ACL categories, one of which is slow. Um, so why would that be slow? And then as it turns out, the basic set command, which also has um, an EX option, so I could do the same thing as set EX, is also big O of one, and it's also slow. Um, whereas, let's go look at something like um, a set command, for example, as in a, a set the data type. So SAD, for example, is also big O of one, uh, but it is ACL fast. So the question is, well, what, why is everything is big O of one, not ACL fast? And the answer kind of boils down to, as I was saying before, because um, fast is not wall clock time, it's relative operations time. So big O of one just means that something's constant time. It doesn't mean that it's going to execute particularly quickly. And then you might be like, well, hang on, Redis is like known as a cache and set and set EX are your basic cache commands. So if they're not fast, then what the heck? Uh, again, these are like all relatively very, very fast things. So I basically didn't know um, why this might be. So I went and chatted to Itamar Harbour, who's on the sort of core Redis team and works with the open source product quite a lot. And we're going to have a look at something that he introduced to me that I had no idea was a thing. So I've got an empty Redis database here. And if I go ahead and do something like um, push some elements to a list, let's call it some key A, B, C, D. I've now got a four element list. And I can do type of some key, and that's a list. Um, if I then try and run a command on it that isn't a list command. So if I try and do a big O of one command, s add some key, and I try and add E, this is going to fail because the data inside that list is um, not a set. And Redis types keys, and it knows that commands operate against a certain type of key. So s add operates against a set. We didn't find a set. We've got a fail. So What's this got to do with things being fast or slow? So imagine my list here is absolutely massive. It's got loads and loads of data in it. It's taking up quite a lot of memory. The thing that I learned this week was I can do, um, let's do set EX, some key, and then I can do like 40 seconds and then hello. So what I would have expected to have happened here is you get something like this wrong key uh, wrong type again operation. And apparently what happens is that set and set EX uh, basically just clobber whatever's there. And that's the potential to take a lot of time is you could be basically unallocating a huge list or something that's there already. So it seems that the set and set EX commands do not necessarily respect the data type. And then if I do TTL some key, it's now got 23 seconds left. And then if we talk for another 23 seconds, it would have disappeared. Um, so yeah, that that was the thing, and that was what I learned. So um, it turns out this isn't a documentation error. Uh, we also had a little chat about how the ACL stuff works, because you might wonder, how can I set up a user that's um, not allowed to run slow commands, but is allowed to run set and set EX? So you know, exceptions to that. And you can do that. You basically just do a sort of ACL user where you put minus, and then the, the category that you don't want them to run, and then plus individual commands that you want them to run that override that. So we had a bit of a discussion about that. But uh, yeah, I had no idea that this sort of thing was a behavior. You know, I, I thought this was going to give an error. Um, we got a question, does it change the type of the key from list to string after set EX? Um, yeah, it does, because if we do type, well, actually, um, it's gone now, so it'll be like null. Um, but let's do it again. So I'll push some key ABC, and then do set some key, and we won't set a timeout this time. Hello, and if we do type some key, it's now a string. 
So basically, it clobbers that and reallocates the memory um, for it. So you've got potential for it to take a little bit longer or to use more resources. Um, the actual user experience should be bigger of one because that memory allocation will happen in the background or while something else is, is going on. But that seems to be basically why for that one, which was news to me. Cool, yeah, and um, you've been working with Redis for quite a long time as well. So if it's news to you, it's going to be news to quite a lot of other people. Yeah, and, uh, I guess it's also just be careful what you're doing with your keys. It's probably a good advert to have a good key naming strategy so that you don't accidentally clobber some key with a set command. It's yeah. almost like a bit of a volatile command, but I'm sure that if we actually protected types, it would probably break somebody's legacy code. So. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Love that legacy code. And uh, thanks again to Itamar for jumping in there and uh, helping us out with that. Itamar is all knowing. I won't say his name a third time because you know what happens when you're saying Itamar's name. Oh, I just said it. <laughs> if you speak his name three times, he's knocking on my door. <laughs> yeah. He'll just, just jump on the stream yard with us. Um, I'm going to drop a little plug here for RU101 because it wouldn't be a live stream if we didn't mention at least one Redis University course. <laughs> You want to learn more about uh, data structures that you can use in Redis, Clue, most, if not all of them, uh, then go to RU101 and uh, take that course. You've got up to six weeks to take any of our courses. Don't be scared by the six week thing. Justin took most of them within like a week <laughs> <laughs> when you joined the company. And um, I took a bit longer than that, but I did it with the help of Justin over a number of weeks last year. So. Uh, if you want a very accessible and gentle way of going through the course, check out our playlist here on YouTube, RU101 Live from last year, where you can see me and Justin putting the fun into fundamentals, as <laughs> always. Cool. Okay. Anything else you wanted to add to that uh, topic there? Um, no, other than if you're interested in access control lists, we'll do another plug. We have a Redis security course that covers those. <laughs> <laughs> it's a RU330, and that's um, that includes Jamie and Kyle. So two uh, two different faces you don't see very often at all on our coursework. So that's kind of fun. That's true, actually. That is very true. A rare course with Jamie and Kyle. And Jamie, I think, is no longer in with Redis. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we won't see another one unless they come back. <laughs> um, but yeah, the ACL reminds me because I am. I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. I was raised in England, and our national sport is football, or what you would call soccer in America. So not like American football, like proper football. Okay, let's not start this American-British thing again. But the one with the round ball. <laughs> and uh, when I was growing up, I was really into football, and ACL to me means anterior cruciate ligament because you always hear about the footballers getting this injury. Yeah. So that's Those are just meant to be torn, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, these these things will get ripped up when they're not supposed to be. So uh, when I saw ACL, I was like, I don't know what that is. But no, that's not what that means. Not today, not today. So uh, yeah, took me back to my childhood. Cool, right. I, I'm in danger of digressing too much. So let us move swiftly on to question number two. And I'm going to take this one. So we had somebody in the Discord, and we meet a lot of people like this who have just discovered Redis. I've been using it a little while and they're like, I, was, I love it so much. I love Redis. They say to us, I can't believe I've lived without it for so long. I just, you know, I've just discovered it and I wish I'd discovered it years ago. So somebody says, I'm a hi, I'm a backend developer and I've recently got familiar with Redis. I loved it a lot. I mean, who doesn't? I have not met anyone who said I've tried Redis and I hated it. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> if that was you, please write to me. I'd love to hear from you because I, I don't believe you all exist. Um, I loved it a lot, and I was thinking of conducting a session among my classmates for introducing Redis to them. But Redis has a BSD license. I'm not much familiar with licenses. So do I need any prior permission for conducting session on Redis? The answer to that question is no. You do not need prior permission uh, if you want to do a little Redis training session. And we really love to hear that somebody wanted to do this because we we are educators and we love to spread the word about Redis. So we really love it when we can teach more people about Redis. And it really warmed our hearts to see that somebody else wanted to do the same thing with their classmates too. So you are very welcome to do that. 
But let me just clear up the confusion that this person had with the licenses in case any of you all are wondering. It is a bit scary when you see a license there and it's a big company. You really don't want to be fighting with a big company, do you? Especially one that's got like offices in America because like you're probably going to lose that fight. So uh, let's have a look at the license. And this comes with the caveat. Let me increase the, sorry, I should have done that earlier. This comes with the caveat that I'm not a lawyer. Justin is not a lawyer. Simon is not a lawyer. This license is not like if you get a Facebook account or if you get any other account or piece of software and you have to sign this whole big set of terms because it's nothing like that. It is literally just a few lines long. So you're, oh, some of these doorbells ringing. Um, so if you want to uh, use Redis, you can fork it and you can see here like 22,000 people have forked Redis. And here is the license. It's kind of, it hasn't wrapped, unfortunately. But you can see it's a very, very short license. And essentially it says you can use it. You just need to credit the creators and the contributors and you can't use the trademarks. Um, but yeah, you can fork it, you can do what you want. But if you're running a training session, you're probably not, necessarily going to want to fork actual Redis, I don't think, uh, if you're just wanting to do a quick intro to it. So you're probably not going to want to fork actual Redis. What you're probably more going to want to do is talk about what is Redis, what could you store with Redis, why would you use Redis, how do you do some simple like um, commands and things like that, a little demo and things like that. So you probably won't need to actually fork or download actual Redis. So because we are educators in this team and this is what we do every day, we do have some materials that if you wanted to, we're quite happy for you to fork them and use them. If you're quite, you know, if you're a little bit stuck as to where to start with this, feel free to come and um, fork our stuff and use it because that's what it's there for. So here is an example of something that Simon has done. He's got an introducing Redis talk. There's a bit of code in here. There's a nice little readme because we do try and make sure we've got some good readmes for people. Um, and this tells you what this particular um, talk will go through. So oh, overview of the Redis data model, basic string demo, connecting microservices, together with queues, Redis streams. Everyone loves Redis streams. If you haven't discovered that yet, like, you'll get addicted. So yeah, you might want to hold up as soon as, uh, as much as possible because you'll just go down a rabbit hole with that one. Um, and then also Simon has included a link to a video of the presentation that he made with that. So if you wanted to fork that one and use that, you can. Or if you wanted to make your own materials and present those, you're absolutely welcome to do so. And if you want to talk to us about how best to like put that together or you don't know what to include or you just want somebody to have a quick look over them or even if you wanted us to come and speak to your group then please come and hit us up in discord and have a chat with us about that we love meeting new people so uh yeah we're quite happy to chat to you about any of the above um simon's um repo is under the mit license which basically means you can use it as you wish um, and you need to give credit to the author and what else does it mean? It's very loose. That's pretty much it. Um, I mean, the, the wider thing here as well is that anything that you see on this channel, um, from the Redis developer team, so myself, Justin, Steve, Guy, Brian, um, Suze, Savannah, and so on is going to be under a similar sort of license. So if we produce something that supports a live stream and you want to use it for something, then please go ahead. If you put it into production without testing it and satisfying yourself that it works for you, then that's uh, on you. Um, we don't offer support per se, but if you want to use any of our code as the basis for anything or to teach the same concepts, say you see Justin talking about in an explainer video, please do. Um, and actually we've had some people work on it in Hacktoberfest as well. So we. We welcome contributions year round, but especially right now. <laughs> yeah. If anyone doesn't know what Hacktoberfest is, it is a month long celebration of um, open source. So you're particularly encouraged to get involved with open source during October because 
a lot of maintainers are geared up to welcoming your contributions and things like that. So if you want to know how we in particular are engaging with the community this month around Hacktoberfest, go to redis.io slash community slash Hacktoberfest. We have had a really great response so far. So we're now three weeks into October. So we've got just over one and a half more weeks to go. And all of the issues that we put out, probably about 98% of them have had PRs merged against them. So we have released some more. Um, so yeah, go along to that web page and then you'll find a link to all of our open issues and see how you could join in with that. Cool. Has anyone got anything they wanted to add to, to that answer? Um, other than that also applies to the courses. So all of our courses, if you took one of our courses a couple of years ago, you kind of downloaded a zip file and it wasn't clear what the deal with the code was. All of our courses now have MIT licensed GitHub repos. So if you want the Python application, uh, you can take them all on the same basis and use them, remix them as you will. Just as I say, don't um, don't expect us to support them if you choose to put those applications into production, which you probably wouldn't do anyway. Yeah, and somebody did find um, a couple of typos in something in one of the new courses. That always yeah. there's always type because the thing is, you've been adjusting my heads down in that for months, so like you're gonna be like blinkered to things. So it was really handy that somebody came along. Like there's only minor things, and it didn't affect the actual course. But it was really nice that they helped us to get it a little bit more polished. Yeah, so the, the 204, the search and JSON course, we went a bit further. So the repo for that contains both the code and all the um, HTML for the text in the course. So if people find issues with the, the text modules, you can just go into GitHub and pull request it. Equally, if you want to borrow those and use them for your own purpose, absolutely go ahead. Yeah. So you can find that under github.com slash Redis Labs dash training. All of our courses are in there. And um, especially for like with this question, it's really exciting because I taught at a boot camp and um, I have taught uh, Redis as a Redis employee uh, to a boot camp that one of my uh, coworkers works for. So if there ever is a need for guidance as far as what would be good to cover so to have a happy path with Redis or if you want me to you know pop in for a little bit of time just to help co-host I'm more than happy because this is we are advocating for Redis so uh, this is a great opportunity if anybody ever wants to do that I'm more than happy to have like a little lunch and learn uh, uh, virtually yeah I feel like we need to do more of them because it's just so easy to spend your whole week just talking to the team I'm like you know I love the team the team are great <laughs> But when you meet other people, it's just, it just, I don't know, it just is the highlight of your week, I think. Oh, absolutely. Plus, people ask questions that we never thought about, which is always amazing. Like, we're kind of in a vacuum here. Uh, we're professing, but we're never, like, absorbing. Uh, so it's always a, not, a really good opportunity for us to, like, hear uh, people's questions. Like yeah, that. and also, you meet people and you think, I had no idea. Well, it just didn't occur to you. Where people are using it because like simon you spoke at a conference mm -hmm. um a week or two ago where you did a talk and you also separately did a workshop and in the workshop you met some like people that you would never have come across normally would you like no so i mean i yeah i've been doing streams workshops i've also separately been doing iot stuff um happened to bump into some folks from sudan who work for a concrete company uh premix concrete um who are looking at doing iot stuff with reddish streams so that's kind of interesting also people have lots of questions about stuff that i didn't know the answers to all of it so you get to do that like i don't know let's learn together type thing yeah uh, yeah if you said to me like tell me about some companies that use redis i would probably go for the easy like oh the banks and the gaming stuff you would not think about a concrete company in another continent at all but you know these are databases any company can use them so yeah it's just so cool to uh to meet practitioners who are using these things in a different way. I could see a concrete company using the aggregate command a lot. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go there with them, but I did think about it. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. And for, for a change, this week it's not me coming with the, uh, with the jokes. <laughs> I'm glad because I'm kind of thinking, oh, I don't know if people can stomach any more of my jokes. But yeah, <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. 
Um, but yeah, like uh, Justin and Simon said, if you want us to uh, do a talk for you or with you, just come on Discord and ask. Please do not be shy. Just come on Discord and uh, find us. We're happy to chat with you about that. Um, cool. Let us go on to the next question. So, hi. I'm new to the course RU101 Introduction to Redis Data Structures. Good. That is a great place to start. I can't find the virtual lab. No, that made me feel sad. Can't find the virtual lab. Is it in GitHub? So who's taking this one? Uh, Justin is. Yeah, I'm taking this one. So yeah, um, as you can see Simon saying here, uh, we have a virtual environment with a Docker um, image that you just run that line and um, you go to a website that it creates locally. And let me actually share my stream right there. And it brings up this virtual environment, which is the RU101. And it's really cool. Simon worked really hard on creating this. Um, and now we actually have uh, a Redis command line. So we have it already full of all the keys that you do with. Uh, again, don't use key star. It's a very dangerous command because it taxes your whole database. But um, all of the data is already pre-populated for you to play with uh, to do your faceted searches and your um, your you know are you one one related manipulations. So that is one way of uh, accessing the virtual lab. Um, but there are other ways of actually accessing Redis for are you one one of all that populated data. Uh, within are you one one within week one, uh, you learn the basics. What are data structures? What are keys? What are strings? And then it's time to get your actually hands into the code. So we under set up your environment, um, we actually talk you through the different ways of setting up your environment. And mainly it's, um, we always recommend now using uh, Redis Insight with Redis Cloud, um, because that means there's nothing on your, on your computer really other than Redis Insight connecting to a cloud instance. Um, you can download and run and roll your own uh, Redis instance, which is great. Um, or you can use a Docker image, which is also super easy. So those are all the different options you have. Um, again, I like Redis Insight because it is free. Uh, so you have a full cloud instance for, uh, you think you get 30 megabytes right now. Um, and all of our courses are designed to actually run uh, within that 30 megabyte limit. Um, there's a cloud. We have um, lots of different ways you can actually like sign up. We walk you through the whole process. Um, and um, you can use your own Redis installation. Um, it's not very hard at all, especially if Redis stack. It's very easy. You can even do brew install. Um, so if you're running a Mac, brew install. Uh, running Windows, you can run Redis on Windows. Uh, Guy actually has a really great video that's almost diehard evergreen on how to install Redis uh, on Windows. It does include uh, running a Docker image, but it's not hard at all. And then lastly, option three, running the lab in your Docker environment. Uh, which is great because a lot. I think all of us as advocates uh, actually run a Docker image just because it's easy to spin up, spin down, and try different versions. And um, yeah, the uh, the repo. Oh, here's here's there's guy. Uh, it's a head in the corner video, so those are always fun to watch. The theme song will get stuck in your head forever. Um, so what you really want to do is uh, go to the GitHub repository for uh, RU101. And there are detailed instructions in the readme on how to actually set this up. Um, so you can actually load the data manually into, um, into your Redis instance, be it on the cloud, so you can link to the cloud with the endpoint and the password, or locally, so you can give it uh, like you know, localhost 6379 is usually the port that we have. Um, and yeah, it's it's relatively straightforward, whatever works for you. So if you have a computer that just can't handle running a Docker image, you can run it in the cloud. If you have, you know, uh, limited access to the internet, um, you can always run it locally um, or with a Docker image. So there's different ways that we can actually um, help you. And as always, you can always ask us, uh, are you one-on-one -on -one questions in Discord? And we're more than happy to help. So yeah, pretty straightforward. Cool, thanks for that. There's almost too much choice. <laughs> yeah. We can always give you our opinion and you can just do that and see how that works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's not legally binding or anything. It's just advice. 
<laughs> take it or leave it. Um, but yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like we all use Macs, but there are millions of Windows users out there, and they all love that video that guy made. Yeah, it no, is, it's uh, it's kind of kind of amazing. That's one of our best performing videos because it's so informational and it's so it's so solid. It's not going to change until Windows 11 decides to change it. But that's another video. <laughs> Yeah, that is another video. And now I'm, my mind is going off into that rabbit hole of remembering when I used to use Windows and all the different versions that I've used. Yeah, I think my first one was 3.1. I didn't yeah, Windows really Work Groups I was using. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, what about you? You're like... <laughs> Probably the same, but my first like commercial work as a software engineer was on Windows NT for Japanese version. Um, which made me look really good because I don't speak a word of Japanese, but all the keyboard accelerators are the same. So if you know how to do, like bring up the file menu, the fact that you can't read anything that is on it does <laughs> not matter. Um, I was doing software localization into the various Japanese scripts, which Windows was a, a leader in at the time. That is quite funny. You look like a complete genius. Like, yeah, I know exactly what this <laughs> no, is. Idea. No idea what any of it says. But... <laughs> Just don't admit it. Just keep calm and carry on typing. But yeah, <laughs> Windows for work groups. Wow, that takes me back. That really does take me back. And we came with a manual. Like everything back in the day came with a really thick book. A box with a CD or some discs. I miss those days because, you know, I used to have kosher copies of different types of software that mm -hmm. belonged to me. And if I got a new machine, I could load it onto the, the new machine. And it was a once and done payment. And now, if you want stuff, you have to subscribe. Mm -hmm. A monthly thing. I feel like that is not too accessible. It was it was much better back in the day. You could save up, buy that thing, and keep it for a long time. I remember when Windows XP came out. Um, my mother, who is a she's a technology education teacher at the the high school uh, that I went to. We both went to the. Uh, launching of Windows XP at a Microsoft conference in Seattle. And I actually won a free copy of Windows XP. Oh. And I was so excited because it was a physical copy of Windows XP. It had special packaging because it was directly from Microsoft as a, as a prize. And um, I don't have it anymore, but man, I was so, I was so excited to have it. And it has a, that, the physical copy of it, you know. Means wow. Things. What did you have to do? Did they just do a, a drawing? Like they just drew your name out? Yeah, it was just a door raffle. So I didn't have to do anything, but uh, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> You're just your usual amazing self. And I'm like, oh, that person looks really cool. I'd give it to them. Oh, I'm it, was just just, it was just like a little pipsqueak. Uh, I think I was like a pipsqueak 17 year old. And there's all these hardened 90s, you know, late 90s uh, developers and engineers They're like, oh, what is this kid doing with his Windows XP? It was w w Windows XP professional too. So that's that's better than Windows XP me. <laughs> oh, Windows XP me, did, that didn't last very long, did it? No, no, the, uh, yeah, the, the home version was pretty, pretty, pretty lame. That, that kind of really kind of got forgotten about quite fast. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just imagining you collecting your prize and it being like the normal box, but like embossed in gold because it was like the special version that was given out as a prize. Yeah, it was uh, kind of like those Disney VHS tapes. It had that kind of packaging on it. Oh, and, uh, wow. Yeah, I was super excited. My hair from down here was up here back then. But yeah. <laughs> oh, are there any photos of you holding this grand prize? I don't think so, unfortunately. <laughs> what a shame, what a shame. Nobody else in my family thought it was that amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's their loss really, isn't it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, like some years later, we are all like really happy about this, doing this story. So uh, makes for good it, stories on the internet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love this stream because every week I learn something new about you all. <laughs> <laughs> One time, the time that Justin won a copy of Windows XP Professional, that I might it's like, yeah, we're all jealous. Cool. Okay, so that's how to get started with RU101. Like Justin said, there are loads of different options, but please don't worry. If you feel like it's overwhelmed, go to the um, guidance in the course literature and it will show you all of those different options and it will walk you through. Um, and if you get stuck, then hit us up on Discord. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, 
watch out on the Twitch channel because we do occasionally just do how to get up and running with whichever course it is and we run through all the courses usually around one week after a course run starts so we've not done that recently i'll try and reinstate it yeah yeah so we're we're trying to um rotate around the team so each person in the team takes one of the courses and walks you through how to do that but uh we're always uh up for any questions you've got about that and are you one i one is a really fun course it, the course itself is fun, and then there's also some extra videos in there that are super fun. I won't spoil it. We have spoiled a couple of them on this stream, uh, so you've seen a bit of a, a peek. But, uh, yeah, there's some really cool videos in there, so I would highly recommend that course. Cool. So let us move on to the fourth question. We thought this was going to be a really short stream today because we have fewer questions, but actually it isn't. But that's all good. So... Somebody by the name of Simon Prickett came onto Discord. And yes, it's not a different Simon Prickett. It is actually our Simon Prickett, the same one. Uh, Simon does a stream on Thursdays called Simon's Things on Thursdays. And it's because it's because it's called Things on Thursdays, it's all about internet things stuff. So Simon is looking for some uh, suggestions as to what to cover next. Simon, do you want to chat to us about that? Yeah, so I am wrapping up a project on there that uses these things, which are Raspberry Pi Pico Ws. That is in a what's called a an Intel Grove Shield. So the irony of this is it lets you connect sensors or other things without doing any soldering. But in order to get it into the shield, you have to do forty solder points to put the the headers or the the sort of long sticky out metal bits that push into here. Um, so I did that off stream because that's really boring television. And we have a couple of these um, and I'm doing a sensor project with them. And this is running MicroPython and a Redis client and we're using streams and we're going to look at using some sort of output display next week. And once we do that, I'm kind of finished. So I thought it would be fun to try and cloud source some, crowdsource some ideas, which is OK, it's a little bit lazy, but otherwise a good community. Um, and I wanted to just quickly show what we've done on this series before. So we built a bloom filter um, using LEDs and, a, and another Raspberry Pi. And in that, we basically looked at how the Redis wire protocol works and built something that you can connect to with Redis CLI or another Redis client. So I did Node Redis, and which will um, act as if it's a Redis bloom bloom filter, but actually it's implemented. I think there's a picture of it here somewhere. It's implemented as an LED matrix, so we store the state of is the bit on or off in, in this LED. So you get this nice visual. Um, it's devastatingly slow compared to real Redis, so don't use this for actual data, of course. But um, you know, the, the fun was in seeing how the protocol works and how you can build something that looks like Redis but isn't. Then more recently, I've been working on this Raspberry Pi Pico MicroPython project. So these things um are not very expensive they cost like six or seven pounds each so about that's unfortunately about seven dollars these days so maybe eight dollars um and they've got wi-fi and basically the interesting thing about these is there's no operating system so they boot to MicroPython and just run your code like an arduino would so i would be interested if people could um jump into discord and we have this channel here internet of things channel and um yeah just let me know if there's anything you'd like to see on here obviously in order to do it i'll need to be able to source the hardware um so what have i got i've got access to some raspberry Pis, which is lucky because they are very hard to get at the moment with the ongoing chip shortage i've got some arduinos i've got some uh, raspberry pi picos and we've got some you know various sensors so if you're interested in that and you or you're interested in seeing reddish used in a particular way with some of these then um let me know we can also do other things that aren't necessarily hardware so like we could for example look at how to build an alexa skill is one of my favorite things using redis um or how to do guys already done a discord bot but we could do something with slack or something else that has an api um so the aim, the aim of the thing is basically we don't build something that has a web front end where possible um, because yeah, there's lots of that out there. We're trying to do something different. So yeah, that's what I'd uh, 
what I got, and uh, hopefully people can um, can come chat to us, and uh, yeah, we might be able to to do something. Um, equally, if, if you're out there and you produce these sorts of things, then let me know. We're always interested in working with people. Yeah, so um, I have dropped a link to the channel that Simon just mentioned, the IoT channel. Um, if you are new to Discord or you, you haven't joined our Discord in particular, then um, you can use any link that we give you to join the actual Discord. Um, it doesn't just give you access to that particular channel. It gives you all the access to all the channels that everybody can get. So it's just one way of getting into the Discord. And then once you're in, you can go around and browse. But the, the link that I've given you just now is a shortcut to that particular channel. Um, so yeah, feel free to come in there. Uh, yeah, it did make me smile when you said it was a bit lazy asking. I feel like actually as developer advocates and developer relations professionals, we are very developer focused. So we don't like to produce stuff that we are, that we want to produce. We, we want to produce stuff that you want us to produce <laughs> because it helps you. And that's the, re the only reason why we were employed is to help you. So uh, so that's why we ask you for ideas, because there is no point us going on and producing a load of content that nobody wants to see that are completely mm. counterproductive. I also forgot to mention the other source of IoT content that we've got is, of course, Justin made a time series video with, well, I'll let you explain what you did there. Then. Yeah, um, for to help me explore and understand time series really well, um, I created air sensors with the Raspberry Pi unit um, and uh, a little blue, um, little blue device that took a sniff of the air and would give me the particulate measurement. Um, I live down in, in the Bay Area, so I was having a lot of wildfire smoke and I wanted to know when the air was bad so I can close the windows and turn on the air purifier. Um, and it actually worked really well. Um, and if you watch the time series YouTube video, uh, but as time series explained, I'll go over the process of, you know, what I did. Um, and it was, it was really, really, uh, it was nice because I had a problem and I needed to solve it. And I knew that uh, IoT would actually help. And so the Raspberry Pi I already have, I've been playing with. Um, and I just basically used a, I, I researched a commercially available air sensor that would be connected to the wireless and contribute to a crowdsourced map. Um, so I, I looked at the schematics of that air sensor. I'm like, oh, I can buy that and I could actually use that. Um, and I did. So everybody can actually use these. Um, I was able to get it to sniff the air. Um, I have two sensors from the front of the house, back of the house, sniffing the air and setting it up in a time series. And I connect that to Grafana because Redis loves Grafana and Grafana loves Redis. And we were able to have really cool visualizations uh, throughout, the, throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, and I'll, I'm very, I'm kind of sheepish to admit this, but I've been very curious about the temperature outside. Uh, so I bought a little, little weather station that shows you the internal temperature and the external temperature. But this is another really great example of something that we can build. Um, so maybe, maybe we can build one of these and show you like the average, t you know, with time series, you can just check out the average uh, at any given point for the day, for the week, things like that. So it's really powerful. It's really cool. Yeah, the possibilities are endless, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the other thing that we probably should look at a little bit more is actually running Redis on these smaller devices too. So we've run Redis clients on there, but you can actually run the server on there as well if you if you want to. I know we've gone we've gone some way towards can we build like a Redis appliance, you know, something you just download an image for and connect to. Right, right. Yeah. We'll so I I still I don't know if I have it directly available to myself right here. Uh, but we had the Redis Cube, which is a 3D printed Redis logo. But you could actually stick uh, a Redis in, uh, Raspberry Pi inside that's running and serving um, Redis wirelessly so you can connect to it and start just using it like a normal Redis machine. It's really cool. Mm. I feel like not enough people are doing Internet of Things stuff. I think it scares people a little bit. Like they don't want their home taken over by robots, but there are <laughs> loads of little projects you could do. Like it's really popular with kids as well, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because it's it's something that they can actually see moving and doing stuff and it's brings it to life a bit more. Yeah. I mean these 
these should be more accessible in terms of ability to buy them and also skill set to use them. So this one here, I had to solder the 40 headers on to plug it into this. Um, it, it, you can actually buy this as a product with the soldering pre-done from Raspberry Pi, but they've been out of stock forever due to the chip shortage. So at the moment, it's do it yourself or find somebody that can that's good with soldering and can do it for you. Um, but in normal supply chain times, you should be able to buy this. It's like one pound or a dollar twenty or whatever more, and it's well worth it because it isn't worth your time doing forty soldering and it's like yourself. Like, <laughs> it's or like you soldering really equipment just to do that. Yeah. So I dropped a couple of links there while uh, Simon and Justin were talking about uh, some projects that Simon has done on his stream. So. Um, there was one about the balloon filter that he'd previously done and currently the Pipe Pico W uh, project as well. And if you wanted to look at Simon's blog, there are loads of different projects on there as well that are written up more in an article format. So simonprickett.dev for those things. So there's some really cool things in there with APIs and all the rest of it. So uh, yeah, cool. What else? Anyone else? Got anything else they want to add to that last topic? I don't know. What else are we working on at the moment? <laughs> everything and everything. <laughs> There's no rest for the wicked. If um, you want to know when we're going live next, uh, developer.redis.com slash redis dash live. Essentially, we are streaming every day of the week apart from Monday. So Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, is Simon, but we also do we do two on Thursdays, so we're available for office hours on Discord, so you can come and chat with us on voice channel if you want to, if you don't want to post. And then Fridays we do this one. Justin, were you just about to say something there when I started? I uh, am gonna stream on Monday. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, the biggest challenge so far for my uh, weekly streaming was finding uh, a fun a fun project to share with everybody, and I found it. Uh, the next hardest part was downloading the data set from the uh, the source that I wanted to use. And uh, it was 137 gigs. I'm like, no. <laughs> Drop down to 37. No. And I now have it down to a, uh, a very manageable bite-sized 6.5 gigs. Um, so people can start playing at home if they actually wanted to. But uh, yeah, on Monday... Um, I haven't picked the time yet. I'll have to figure that out, but I'll broadcast it out on Discord. And uh, yeah, I'll be streaming. Pretty exciting. Nice. I feel like I pressured you last week, didn't I? Because when I said to everybody, oh, there's a schedule, there's a Justin-shaped hole in the Monday <laughs> It was good motivation. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but no. I, not to talk about it too much, because I know that um, you know, our time is coming up. But basically, uh, I love birds. I love watching and uh, observing birds so we're going to be able to create our own little bird app where we can search for birds and like did i just see that outside my window yes maybe you did so we'll, we'll be playing with that with redis json and redis search yeah and when you were telling us about this the other day in the team meeting and you were saying you know is it the size of a sparrow is it the size of a chicken i'm like i actually hadn't thought about that but it's true isn't it you can narrow it down by different things yeah so um, yeah this is going to be an interesting oh, things that ask you so many questions about a tree and then tell you what tree it's likely to be. Right, There's like, right. ironically, binary chop things probably <laughs> like you can get rid of half the trees by asking, does it have no leaves on it in winter? Or something. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect for a Redis search opportunity, so I'm excited. And that is a good quick quiz question. What is the, what do you call a tree that is not evergreen, that sheds its leaves in the autumn? We don't the have those here. Deciduous, ah. deciduous. I remember being taught that in uh, what you would call elementary school. And I was like, why do we need to know this? But then 30 years later, won the pub quiz. So there you go. <laughs> thank you to my old teacher. Mm. Yeah, we definitely have those here. We got a yard full of leaves and all the drains were blocked today with the rain. So <laughs> yeah, we, we know all about those trees. And I'm still laughing at what you were saying about that data set and getting it down to six and a half gig because my Windows for Work Groups computer would not have been able to handle that. We definitely <laughs> didn't have six and a half gig of disk space. Yeah, I'm excited to put that all in memory too. That'll be fun. <laughs> it's going to be so cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, 
that will be at some point on Monday after 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Pacific. So uh, later in the day if you are in the UK or any point east of here, but it will all be recorded and on YouTube and Twitch, so do not worry. Don't don't get the FOMO because you'll be able to catch the recording. You can even play it back slow-mo if you want to really savor it, <laughs> it out for a couple of hours. So you can uh, really drag it out. <laughs> you could, you could, just to make sure. So uh, yeah, I'm just gonna give a quick shout out. Sensos, hello from Thailand, hello to you, Sensos. Thanks for joining us. Abraham in Miami and Mephalich, I think, is also on the West Coast as well so thank you all for joining us today that is it that is it for this week if you want to be featured on next week's this week in discord anonymously of course then come and post something to us in discord and uh, we may well feature it on next week's stream but until then look after yourselves everyone stay safe and have a great weekend bye yeah bye.